Okay. And Chris, you are unmuted and you can go ahead and share your screen and get started. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, thanks everyone for having me here. Boom. Hopefully you see a big blue screen that says, welcome to the Modus Revolution. And if you do, let's get started. Uh, and uh, all right, as you heard, I'm from the Pasadena Audubon Society, and I've been kind of the person most enthusiastic about doing uh, MODIS stuff for Pasadena Audubon. A lot of us are big fans of it. And uh, I'm going to take just a little while tonight to talk about how we got interested in, in this topic, what it is, and how maybe you folks can get involved too. So, uh, first of all, what is MODIS? Uh, we're going to I'm going to explain it in more depth in just a little while, but just to begin, the first, just to have a quick one or two sentence uh, defini definition of it, it's an electronic technology that allows us to uh, learn more about the greatest phenomenon in all of nature, which is bird migration. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the sh super short explanation of what MODIS is, it's a method of putting tiny, tiny transmitters on birds, like you can see in this photo here, and uh, and then uh, watching where the birds travel to. It's it's the latest, actually, in a long line of technologies we've had to try to figure out the the mystery of where birds go. Some of you may be familiar with some of the uh, uh, some of the technologies we had before. If you want to learn more about it, there's a really great book called Flight Paths by a woman named Rebecca Heisman. And it's it's a history of all the all the ways we've tried to uh, learn about bird migration over the centuries. And, it, and it's got some great stuff in it. Like, for instance, back in the 1500s, there was a Swedish minister named uh, Olaus Magnus. He thought that birds like, uh, like so swallows and swifts just burrowed down into the mud at the bottom of ponds. And that's where they went every winter when they when they noticed the way. People have always noticed that some birds are around in the summer and then in the winter they're gone and and other birds show up in the winter and aren't around in the summer and some just kind of pass through. Uh, but it, it's, it's for millennia. It was a mystery what actually happened. And people came up with theories like that one. Uh, my favorite is, is uh, Charles Morton, who was a minister in the 1600s. And he he said with the certainty that, that only a, a 17th century minister can have that uh, birds, particularly swans, just flew up to the moon every every winter. And uh, you know who who could who could prove him wrong? Uh, uh, another milestone in in learning about bird migration was from uh, uh, John James Audubon, who in 1804 tied some silver thread to uh, some. Eastern Phoebe's. We've never seen it. That's what Eastern Phoebe, uh, and uh, let them go, and they came back. You know, the the following year. So he said that proves that you know the same bird comes back to the same spot. Actually, Audubon may or may not did that. He might have very well made that story up. But uh, but there is one uh, hallmark of early migration study that is absolutely. Uh, without doubt something that really happened because we have the actual proof and it's sitting in a museum in uh germany right now it's this poor guy here this uh God. this stork uh this stork was shot by a hunter in germany in 1822 uh and the hunter i mean noticed the bird was somewhat odd and when he went to retrieve the the bird he discovered it had this spear through its neck so i mean he was shot with a gun he wasn't shot with the spear the bird already had the spear in its neck. And it turns out there have been a few dozen examples like this of birds that have been shot by hunters that already had an arrow or a spear uh, in them, but still managed to survive. A uh, An anthropologist uh, took a look at this bird and took a look at the spear, and that's where the bird was shot, where that, that star is, and uh, realized that the, this, the spear was from... Uh, uh, an African uh, tribe or an African African peoples that uh, they're in Central Africa. So this was like virtually undeniable proof that at least that this stork and storks in Germany were flying down to uh, 
Africa every year and then coming back, you know, a distance of thousands and thousands of miles. Uh, in 1899, this guy, uh, Hans Christian Cornelius Morgenstern, uh, he was a board, uh, uh, ornithologist in Denmark. He came up with the idea of putting tiny little, uh, little rings, little bands on birds. And we've been doing bird banding ever since. We've been doing this for more than a century now. Just in the U.S. alone, uh, we have banded 63 million birds in the last century. We'll ban about 1.2 billion this year before the year is over. And uh, and we've a huge amount of what we've learned over the last century about migration has been because of these bird banding studies. And when you capture a bird and band it, you can learn a lot about the bird. You can measure it. You know, you have the date, obviously, when you captured it. You can measure its its weight and its its uh, its dimensions. You can see how much fat or how skinny the bird is. You can, uh, yeah, you know, figure out it, its age, all that type of stuff. You can take blood samples for DNA analysis, all sorts of things like that. I mean, a lot of great science. But it doesn't do the one thing that would be really helpful for migration science, and that is give you some sense of where the bird is going or where the bird came from. To do that, you have to capture the bird again, the, the same exact bird, capture it again now that it has a band on it at another location. And then you can say, oh, well, we know that this bird went from point A to point B. Problem is that can be really tough. Uh, some birds, it's not too bad. Like, for instance, mallards. Of all the mallards that are banded in uh, the U.S., about 40% of them get get uh, captured again or a birder or someone else at least, you know, looks through binoculars or a telescope and can see a, a band number and, and report it. So it, if you're studying mallards, you get a pretty good return on, uh, on your data. Uh, if you're something like this, uh, black-throated green warbler it's it's terribly poor it, it's uh the 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 second capture rate for black-throated green warblers is 0.08 percent that's that's like less than one bird in 1000 will ever be captured again so that's that's just a horrifically inefficient way to to try to figure out where a specific bird has traveled uh but this, was, this has always been a quandary for bird scientists like this guy here. And he, uh, bird scientists around the mid-century as electronics, uh, particularly like uh, transistorized electronics started to appear and become more ubiquitous and become less expensive. Uh, uh, bird scientists started thinking, well, what if we could put some sort of electronic tracking devices on birds? Uh and uh, they they were taking a page from from the books of the the mammal people who had already been playing with putting trackers on uh, on mammals, particularly you know big mammals like like tigers, wolves, uh, bears, and here here in the Southern California area, uh, mountain lions. And it's way easier to do to put a, put electronics on a big mammal. They. Uh, you know, the, the weight concern isn't nearly as big. They don't travel nearly as, as far or as fast. And uh, when you when you go out there to, to find where they are, and typically the way it, it was always done back then was you'd be, you know, an actual researcher and you would go out into the field with radio tracking equipment like this. Uh, that would work. It, that was much, this was much less practical with, with birds. Uh uh, as you would expect, the first place where they did try it with birds were for uh, big flightless birds like this Rhea, for instance, in, uh, in I believe this one was in Africa, uh, it has a, a, a tracker on it. Uh, some of you may remember this famous photo from National Geographic back in the 70s where they put a uh, put a tracking backpack on a, on a Gen 2 penguin to uh, to track how it, it, it traveled across the Antarctic continent. Uh, I should mention they did take the pack off before it got to the ocean because it would not have been not have been too good to swim with that. But uh, I always loved I mean, back when I was like a kid and it's like, maybe I want to be a bird scientist. This was just like my favorite photo in the world. Uh, 
so we started to get uh as, as electronics got smaller we started putting tracking things onto uh actual flying birds we started with bigger birds like like eagles uh there and with all these tracking things there's always trade-offs uh the more you want the transmitter to be really powerful so you can find the bird from a long distance away you if it has batteries, you want the batteries to last a long time. You want it to be really sturdy and handle all sorts of weather and stuff. All of that means the tracking device gets heavier and heavier. So it's a real problem to put it to put these type of tracking devices on birds, particularly when you're dealing with a really little bird like like this uh, uh, kinglet here. Uh, it took a long, long, long time for radio transmitters to become small enough that you could put a uh, put one of them on on a small bird and uh just a quick sidebar there if you're a, a bird researcher there are uh ethical guidelines you have to follow and among those got for for capturing birds banding them putting transmitters on them and among the guidelines there's a, a standard rule that the transmitter the band everything else you put on the bird, can only weigh three percent of the bird's weight, which is a, you think how how light this kinglet is. Think of what only three percent of that weight is. So, uh, to get a transmitter on here, that transmitter has to be really, really small. And uh, and as difficult as it is, it's really important to get them on these little birds because very, very often these are the species that we really want to study. That that. You know, may have may be facing a lot of the uh, environmental difficulties and uh, and have some of the most interesting uh, life cycles. And uh, you know, the more we can study these little guys, the, I mean, the the more we can learn about bird migration in general. And all of that sets the uh, sets the stage for the rise of this thing called modus. So let's actually talk about. First of all, the word, it's a, it's a weird word. It's Latin for uh, movement. And, mm -hmm. and and the modus system consists of, of two parts, two separate bits of electronics. The The first part are these tiny, are the transmitters. And these are very, as you can see, these are very, very small transmitters. Small enough that they can be attached to, to small birds uh, while still fitting that ethical guideline of uh, 3% or less of the body weight. The very smallest modus transmitters can even be placed on insects like this butterfly or even down to this honeybee. Uh, so that's the first part of the transmitter. Now, these, since these transmitters are so small, they're not very powerful. They only transmit a few miles, maybe 10, 15, 20 miles, somewhere in there, but not the hundreds and hundreds of miles. So that means you have to be relatively as these things go relatively close to detect them which brings us to part two of how modus works uh it works by setting up detection stations all around the landscape all around the area where these birds are traveling this is what a typical modus station looks like it's not much to look like it looks kind of like uh you know the maybe like the tv antennas your you know your your parents or your grandparents had way back in the day and uh, these stations just sit there listening for tags, the, these transmitter tags that have been attached to birds. Uh, a good analogy is it's just like the uh, the fast track system that that many of us have in our cars. We all have, the, you know, if you have the fast track system, you have a little transmitter. You it's it's in your car, and you just you know you go about your life. But when you're on a uh, a compatible highway you'll pass by one of these detection stations and it will it will detect you. This is just how modus works. You put the transmitter on a bird, the bird goes about its life and if it passes near a detection station, it gets its 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 presence gets uh gets recorded. Uh modus was invented by uh Birds Canada, the uh the the big controversial the conservation the avian conservation uh organization in Canada, the leading organization up there. Uh, about 10 years ago, and right from the start, their their design was to make these transmitters absolutely as small as possible to get it to make as many species as possible uh, candidates for this this technology. And you can look and see how tiny these transmitters are. Uh, 
the way you'd put this one on, by the way, those two those two loops are just you know bits of elastic that have been super glued on there, and you actually stick the bird's legs through there, so they end up wearing it kind of like in the in the small of their back, kind of like like a little fanny back thing, pack uh, type situation with that little wire antenna hanging out hanging out along its tail. Uh, there have been a number of studies on uh, th does this. Do these transmitters affect the the survivability of birds? And it looks like, uh, as far as we can tell, the answer is no. The birds probably don't like it, but uh, we don't think it really significantly decreases their their ability to migrate the distances they wanted to go in the time they wanted to do it in, their ability to uh, to find mates, to raise young, all that type of stuff. Yeah. Uh, the 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 current belief is. The biggest stress on the bird is the actual catching it and handling it, which is the same thing that happens when you're uh, bird banding and without putting a transmitter on. The transmitter, uh, the weight of the transmitter doesn't seem to have any additional adverse effect. And I, I do want to say that uh, in the same way that you need to be uh, trained and certified and supervised to legally ban birds, you also need to be trained and supervised and uh and all that to legally put electronic transmitters like a modus tag on on a bird it's it's if you're a bird bander it's another uh kind of like certification you can get another another uh, uh another bit of training you could get so since these transmitters are so small they're not recording like temperature or the bird's heart rate or anything like that there are electronics that can that can do that uh they tend to still be you know so big that they they're they're really rare to get them on something as small as a warbler but there are studies that do things like that for things like seabirds and and stuff like that the modus transmitters all they do is just broadcast a serial number every every few seconds maybe every few minutes and then they turn themselves off to save batteries and then they turn themselves back on a couple minutes later and just just blast out a serial number and then go back to sleep again uh so as i said they, they they're these small transmitters have a range of, oh, 10, 15, maybe 20 miles. So for this system to work, you need to set up a whole network of these listening stations. And one of the brilliant things, by the way, about the MODIS system is that uh, any bird transmitter can be detected by any compatible MODIS station. So if I'm, uh, say, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a bird researcher from... I don't know, Harvard University, and I put a bunch of transmitters on birds, they won't just get picked up by Harvard uh, listening stations. They'll get picked up by listening stations set up by any organization anywhere anywhere in the world. Uh, so MODIS started just about 10 years ago. Uh, uh, and I'm going to show a few slides of how the, uh, how the network has expanded over time. As I said, it was started by Birds Canada, so they first started up in the maritime provinces. You see there in Nova Scotia. Each one of these yellow dots is, is a MODIS listening station. They put a few in New England. They put a, a, a group of them in uh, north central Ohio. If you, any of you have ever gone to the biggest week in American birding, right, right there around, around uh, Toledo, it's a great migration hotspot. Uh, and a couple, uh, whoops, sorry. Uh, a couple of years later, we made it up. We started getting some more in uh, all through Ontario, a bit more up along the St. Lawrence Seaway, just barely starting to get some in the United States. Uh, a couple more year, years, 2018, we're now starting, we got this nice strip uh, along Texas. And I want everyone to take a look at uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, you'll notice there's like a, a diagonal line uh, across Pennsylvania. This was one of the, the, the first big MODIS projects in the U.S., and uh, those, each one of those is a modus listening station, and they're close enough together that if you're a bird, it's virtually impossible now to cross the state of Pennsylvania without without detecting your modus transmitter. They've set up this really cool like uh, picket fence type thing. Uh, here we are, 2020. It's really taken off in the, in the east. If you look over at California, we're we barely have any. We stink at getting motor stations. Uh, two years ago, we started to get a lot more motor stations, but still for a state as big as California, not nearly enough. And here's where we are today.
there's right around a hundred stations in California, which is which is great, and that's nearly double what it was, say, two years ago. But for a state as big as California, right smack dab in the middle of the Pacific Flyway, we could use a lot more stations, listening for a lot more birds. So that's that's the state of uh, Modus right now. And uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about what these stations are like, what, it, you know, what's actually involved with one. And they all consist of one or more antennas and a bit of electronics that are connected to the antennas. The electronics just sits there and listens. And if it detects a bird, it sends all the data back to uh, a central repository at, Bird, at Birds Canada. And stations come in every variety and shape you can imagine. There's some are bolted to buildings like this. Some are sitting on the roofs of high rise. It's like, like this one that's sitting on the top of a high rise in uh, in Chicago. Uh, sometimes people put up a big radio at tower and set them up. Sometimes they're just just a pipe stuck in the ground. You can they're, they're they 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 there's as I said every shape and size. Uh, typically they'll have several of these antennas and these as I said these weird kind of old style TV antennas. They're technically called Yagi antennas. Here's what one of them looks like. And they work kind of like directional microphones. They're really good at picking up radio signals in the direction that they're pointing. So you can kind of like adjust where the mic, where these things point to, uh, so you can point them in areas where you think there might be more birds coming. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a second. Uh, the actual, so as I said, these, these antennas are all connected to like a, a, rece a receiving station. And the receiving stations are not much to look at look like that they're just like you know a gray box and inside it there's a bunch of electronics with uh some computer stuff in there they uh also have uh mechanisms so they can connect back to the to like modus headquarters uh they can connect by a cellular telephone a satellite telephone uh if there's wi-fi nearby they can use that you can plug a ethernet cable into it uh or if they're out in somewhere in the middle of nowhere where there's no connectivity they'll just you can set them up so they just save the data and then you send a researcher out there to you know slap on snowshoes and then go trek out there and uh retrieve the data manually uh and uh they can run on normally you just you plug them into a wall out and if you have one available if not you just connect it to a uh a solar power a solar cell solar panel and they can run off solar and as i said all the data goes back to uh to uh, the MODIS folks in Canada. And the overwhelming uh, majority of data is, is free for the public to view for you you or me, uh, as well as the scientific community to, to look through, to grab, to, to use any way they want. There are a few cases where if you're a researcher and you absolutely want to keep your da data private, like for instance, you're collecting data and you don't want to uh, make it public until you publish your, your paper or get your PhD or whatever. You can do that, but the overwhelming majority of the data is just is just sitting there and you can go look at it and play with it. And let's go ahead and do that right now. Here's uh this is just a page I picked kind of at random from the from the Modus website. Uh what this is, this is one part of several pages of uh, the reports from a MODIS station on uh, South Padre Island in in Alaska, near the near the southern tip, not in Alaska, sorry, Texas, uh, near the southern tip of Texas. It's a, it's a great migration hotspot. And you can see over the course of, oh, I don't know, three months or so, between 2023 and 2024, they had, they had some gulls, they had some whippoorwills, they had a bobolink, they had a wood thrush, they had a chestnut-colored longspur. That's cool. They had a saw-wet owl fly past their station. So these birds are just going around, you know, just out there living their lives, and they just happened to fly within a few miles of this station, and the station uh, detected them. So let's take a look at one of these a bit more. Uh, let's look at this one entry for Eastern Whippoorwill. Uh, those of you that have never been back east, this is this is an Eastern Whippoorwill. They're, they're very similar to... Uh, uh, you know the 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 nighthawks that we have here, 
very, you know, very same family, all that. Uh, they actually are in very, very serious decline in the Eastern U.S. There's there may be ten percent as many as there were when I was a kid. I'm from Pennsylvania originally myself, so I mean, whippoorwills were an absolute, you know, common part of my childhood summers, and they're very, very rare now. So let's take a look at this one, this one whippoorwill, uh, your page, and this is the uh, you can on the Modus website. This is the information about this one bird. It that's the that's its tag serial number on there. You can see that it was uh, tagged as part of this thing called the Maine Nightjar Monitoring Project. Uh, tagged by a guy named Logan Parker on July 9th, 2023. And there's the you know latitude and longitude where he's detected. And you notice it says days uh, days detected. That means this, as this bird has gone about its life, there have been 80 days where some modus station somewhere has detected it. And there, it has been detected by 13 different stations throughout that time. So one of the things you can do is click on that little thing where it says show the detections in a map and you'll see a map like this. And this is a snapshot of how this one eastern whippoorwill uh, traveled about over the course of about 18 months. You can see it got detected in, in Houston. It was down in southern Mexico. It, it bopped up to the Midwest, to Illinois and Indiana. What I think is really interesting that it did this from there, it did this thing of flying up to Maine and then uh, flew west from Maine and flew all the way to North Dakota. And that's where it actually hung out for about a month or so, uh, no doubt, raising, uh, you know, ra raising a family. Uh, so you would never get this this uh, great uh, detail from just banding birds. You would never learn what this what one bird had done uh it, and th as i said this is just one you know one snapshot from one bird but of course there's way more than that they have put modus transmitters on more than fifty thousand animals so far the vast majority are birds but they also put them on bats they put them on insects uh they put them on some terrestrial animals as well uh over 400 different species of of animal around the planet have had at least one modus tag uh, put on them. Uh, the stations are also all around the world. They, the program started here in North America. So the majority of stations still are in North America, but there are stations appearing in more and more places throughout the world. There's over uh, 2000 stations right now in 34 countries. And as I said, they're all just sitting there listening for a, uh, for these transmitters and whenever you know whenever a transmitter goes past it gets detected and reported and if you look at the sum total uh over the past 10 years we have gotten 1.5 billion billion with a b uh detections in modus towers of you know a, a little thing going beep 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 up you know this this one bat just flew past or this one hummingbird or this one albatross uh, and of course, with all this data, all sorts of cool things can happen. One of my favorites uh, recently is the uh, these great flight maps, which I think many of you might have seen uh, on, uh, on on the Audubon websites that have that take data from a lot of sources, including uh, including Modus, and create these wonderful animations. This is a migration of Swainson's hawks, and uh, and a great. And a, a, a great amount of the data that's driving this are are reports of uh, Swainson hawks equipped with e equipped with uh, with modus uh, tracking uh, tracking software, modus tags detected by modus stations, and it's just endlessly cool to look at this stuff. Uh, we have a uh, we have uh, we'd passed in Audubon have set up. Uh, two modus stations already we've helped install about another half dozen or so and we have uh we have more in the works and this is one of my favorite tracks that we've detected this is of a a hoary bat it's a species of bat that lives here in the west it got tagged up i might have i guess clipped this off it got it got tagged by bat researchers up in vancouver it then began its fall migration and flew 
down into uh, Northern California. You can see to Chico, down through the Central Valley, uh, over east of Bakersfield, then right above the A in Los Angeles. That's actually one of our receiving stations, or one at uh, Bear Divide. It then flew to the Salton Sea, and it got to the Salton Sea in one day from uh, from the Angeles National Forest, which I thought was very impressive. And I didn't think I didn't think bats moved that fast. And then a few days later, it flew and got detected in another station uh, out near the Santa Monica Mountains. Now, these lines, you know, these these are straight lines. Of course, these animals aren't traveling in straight lines. The straight lines all indicate places where we're just connecting the dots that we have, the data that we have. And every one of these places where there's a long straight line, that would be a great place if we could have another transmitter to uh, get some more some more data. So let me talk a little bit, if I can. Oh, and by the way, I should say, if you folks have questions, uh, you throw them in the chat, interrupt me, what, whatever. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very easy that way. But I, I want to talk now about how we at Passivity and Audubon really got so excited about MODIS. And... Uh, uh, three things kind of happened simultaneously. Uh, the first thing we uh, we had uh, a speaker come uh, talk at one of our uh, monthly meetings. Uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm Joni's counterpart at Pasadena Audubon. I'm the guy that does the does the speaker program at Pasadena Audubon, and I got this guy named Scott Widensall to come speak. He's he's a great guy. Uh, many of you have, have read his stuff for years in Audubon magazine and, and, uh, the Cornell magazine and, and, and many other places. Uh, he's been involved with MODIS since the, uh, uh, since the, since the beginning, uh, back in, uh, he's from Pennsylvania originally, just like me. And, uh, he's, he's the guy that put those towers all the way across the state of Pennsylvania. And, uh, so he's been a big MODIS person for a long time. And he wrote, maybe the best current book on bird migration, a world on the wing. I, I really cannot recommend it highly enough. It's, it's absolutely great. There's, there's uh, great stuff in there ab about Modus and about the work that he's done, but more importantly, just about how miraculous and astonishing bird migration actually is. I guarantee there, are, there are passages in there where your jaw will just hit the floor. You cannot believe some of the stuff that bird uh, birds do. So he was very inspiring. That was this was literally the first time I had ever heard of Modus was was his talk. Uh and uh the 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 second factor that got us uh interested was looking at this map uh right after Scott's talk, looking at how few stations there were in California. And that's just, you know, that's just crazy. Here we are on one of the continent's major flyways. And, uh, you know, if you look at the Atlantic flyway, yeah, they're doing a pretty good job detecting birds there, but we're doing a terrible job de detecting modus equipped birds out here you know, in the Pacific flyway. So, you know, we and other folks at Pasadena Audubon thought, let's see if we can, you know, start to do something to change that. Uh, and the third thing that happened was right around the same time, we discovered uh a, a place called bear divide i don't know if, how many of you folks down down in san diego county have heard of heard of this place this is a spot in the angeles national forest it's about oh i don't know 40 minutes uh northwest from downtown los angeles up, up in the san gabriel mountains and the topography there here forms this kind of natural funnel so in springtime as birds migrate north you know they're coming up from uh Mexico or Central or South America, they they were flying right past you folks in you know in San Diego, and then through past Orange County, coming up into Los Angeles County, and and they hit the San Gabriel Mountains, which run east to west. And they've got to get over the mountains, and just the way the land the landscape is arranged here, the birds naturally funnel themselves up through this one valley, and at the very uh, crest, kind of like the little saddle before you clear the mountains and go down into the central valley on the other side, it's an area of maybe, maybe the size of a couple of tennis courts and thousands and thousands and thousands of birds can on, in one day can funnel through that one tiny area. It's this natural, uh, this natural concentration of my, of migratory birds. Uh, 
the first paper, scientific paper on it came out just a few years ago. And uh and this is this is in the wake of of some some bird researchers and birders kind of discovering this place. Uh here's a uh here's a re, uh eBird report from 2020, the first year people really started paying attention to bear divide. And you'll notice it's like uh 10,000 birds went went past this spot in in three hours uh i might have and with i forget how many let me just move this out of my way sorry uh with uh look at that uh 76 birds a minute more than a bird a second flying flying right past you there and uh if you've never come i i really recommend making making the trip up uh it, you know when the conditions are right on a on a, on a morning in uh in may it can really be spectacular so we had this uh we had this big interest in modus there aren't really many modus stations at all in california and we had this this great migration hotspot so it it struck us as like this would be a really smart place to put a, a modus station and uh as I said, Bear Divide is is part of the Angeles National Forest, which is part of the San Gabriel Mountains National Monument. So we had to go talk to uh, talk to the the Forest Service, and uh, you know and the Forest Service is actually a part of the Department of Agriculture. So we ended up having to talk to Department of Agriculture people. They actually no one was against the idea, but you know it is it is a big federal bureaucracy, and it did move slow, and it took us about a year to finally get a. Uh, permission to put a station, uh, a modus tracking station uh, on the National Forest property. So at that point, uh, we came to the next realization. It's like, well, none of us have ever actually <laughs> built a modus station ourselves before. We've just been reading about it. Uh, so what we did at Pasadena Audubon is we went and we, uh, we found these folks, the Southern Sierra Research Station. They're up in uh, Kern County and they're really interesting folks. They, they'd be, they would, they could be a very good uh, speaker for your, your group. They, uh, they do a lot of cool studies in the, in, in the Southern Sierras. They do amazing, interesting studies on yellow billed cuckoos, by the way, which are another uh, species under, under threat. And, and they have great modus expertise. They set up dozens and dozens of, of stations. So we basically kind of like subcontracted to them. We, we hired them to, uh, to kind of do a sanity check on what we wanted to build and where we wanted to put it and to actually help us uh, install the thing when it came time to install it. And here's where we ended up installing it. It, it turns out up at Bear Divide, there's actually a, uh, the Forest Service is a fire station there and they had this old abandoned uh, cinder block building there. Ironically, it was a building that, it used to be their the Forest Service's laundromat there for the 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 fire station there, and it burned down while they were uh, while they were out fighting a, a wildfire somewhere else. So the place the place was a mess, but it still had electricity, and it still had uh, you know it was still a structure that stood there. So they gave us permission to uh, install our motor station there. So we uh, we hired uh, the Southern Sierra folks and. You know, they and 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 me and some other people showed up there one day and uh, bolted up. You know, put some antennas in there, put the electronics inside, and we actually then had a working uh, motor station. We even had a little, uh, you know, ribbon cutting ceremony and everything. Uh, since then, as I said, we've installed another station in the Hollywood Hills. We've uh, we did the install for the one at the Los Angeles Zoo uh, last. Over this past summer, I helped install one uh, in Ventura County in Fillmore. We're helping uh, Los Angeles Audubon install one at their at their uh, at their visitor center, the Debs Nature Center. If any of you have ever been there, and uh, another thing we do, and it's something I haven't really talked about in uh, in this talk so far, is we uh, we also ha we have a grant program at uh, at Pasadena Audubon, and we we particularly like to fund people that are using MODIS in their research. Because uh, in addition to putting the transmitters up, uh, you actually, you need the the tags as well. Though, or, I'm sorry, in addition to putting the receivers up, the listening stations, you need the transmitters to put on the birds, the little the little transmitter tags. They're 
they're not cheap. They're about 200 to 250 dollars each. So we actually have a, we have an active grant problem uh, problem uh, project to uh, help help pay for uh, tags that qualified researchers can put put on their birds. So that's that's what we've been doing at Pasadena. So now I'm hoping that we can get you to uh, you know kind of like join the army and uh, to to get you interested in, in that and kind of let you know what uh what's involved i'm gonna i'm gonna run through real quick uh how you actually do a moda station and uh i'll try to for this to not be too technical you know anyone if anyone wants to you know mute me and play with their cat for a couple of minutes i, I totally understand so uh here's how here's how you modus uh the first step is you need to pick a, a location for uh for the listening station. And there's a few factors you should consider. One, are there other stations nearby? Obviously, if there's a station down the block, no need to put a second one there. Uh, second, is it a good bird spot? Now, it it may not it may not have to be a place as amazing as Bear Divide. You don't need thousands of birds coming past all the time, but might make more sense to put one at a place that does get it does get some bird traffic. As a general rule, if it's a place you like to go birding, it's probably a good place that you could have a modus station. And uh, the third factor that we look at is this thing called a view shed. And I'm going to explain that uh, to you right now. It turns out that the just the, the physics of how the transmitters and the receivers work, the transmitters, uh, their signals are what are called line of sight. Uh, the, the, the radio signal from the bird goes out in direct lines and it can be it can be blocked if the birds like on the other side of a hill if the birds on the other side of a building even if the birds uh inside a forest the trees can be enough to block the signal you need to have uh for the the transmitter and the uh and the receiving station to have a clear you know kind of like radio view of each other uh so th this is the reason that many modi stations are put up on towers or Put on put on peaks, put on top of buildings, that 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 type of thing. This is to increase this this thing called a view shed, and this picture hopefully kind of explains it. Uh, view shed is basically what you can see uh, when you when you're when you're at a point, or if you're a uh, modus antenna, what you can you know what where you can detect signals. Uh, if you to just use this picture, all. If you were a bird in any of the areas where there's a uh, a green check and you had a modus transmitter and if that that hiker was the receiving station, they'd be able to they'd be able to pick up your signal just fine. If you were a bird at one of the places where the the, the red X is, the station may not be able to pick you up. So it could be a good idea to have a uh, uh, a good view of the surrounding territory have a good what's called view shed uh view sheds you can generate view sheds uh with a number a number of different uh software packages any of you who use what's called gis software you know uh, geographical information system software for mapping surveying stuff like that uh they can do view sheds there's there's a number of uh sites online that do them and uh, it's built in, view sheds are built right into uh, uh, Google Earth. And I don't, when I say Google Earth, by the way, I don't, I don't mean the, the website Google. Google makes a standalone product that you can download for, for Mac or for PC called Google Earth. And it has a way of generating view sheds. And so let's, let's take a look at a couple and I'll show you how they work. Uh, so I picked a, uh, the the Moro Preserve, which I think many of you folks are familiar with. And I said, well, what if we wanted to put a modus transmitter there? And uh, I said, let's say it's on a tower that's uh, 10 meters tall. It's about, you know, uh, oh, a couple stories tall, like about as tall as, tall as this, say, TV antenna on your house. Uh, and if you, you look at this map, everything that's in green is stuff that if you're at the top of that antenna, that stuff, that's land that you could see. That's that's the view shed. And you'll you'll notice that like to the to the east and a bit to the south, uh, there's a good bit of green. So you can see stuff there. 
if if you look up to the north though toward the top of the screen there's not really much green at all so if you were a bird that was flying around in there you may not get detected by a modus station uh these maps can be a little bit pessimistic because this is assuming you're looking at the ground and the birds are you know up in the air so it might be it might be a good bit better but you get the general idea and one thing you'll notice that if you raise the tower higher like if you keep watching the screen Right now, the tower is 10 meters high, and now it's 30 meters high. And you can see we've picked up a bit more green. Here it is lower. Here it is higher. Uh, but that may not be uh, worth the trouble. High, uh, taller towers are more expensive, you know, or every, more hassle. Anyway, you get the idea. So these view sheds can be very helpful in figuring out if there's a good place to put a motor station. Like, as a general rule, you wouldn't want to put one down at the bottom of a valley if you could put it at the top of a uh, of a mountain top. You wouldn't want to put it in the middle of the forest if you could put it out in a field or along the edge of the forest. Uh, okay, so now if you think you have a uh, a location that could work pretty well for a motor station, there are just a few other things you want to consider. Uh, is there some sort of structure there that you could easily bolt the tower onto? Maybe a telephone pole? That you could get access to maybe a building maybe a barn something like that is there electricity there uh you don't have to have electricity as i said you can run these things off off solar panels but if you do have electricity it's nice is there access that you can get to it motor stations are, are really reliable once they're built but you know it it would be nice if you didn't have to climb to the top of a 14,000 foot peak using ropes and crampons to get up there to check on the station. It'd be nice if you could drive, you know, drive up to it. Uh, if it is in an area that's populated, is security an issue? You know, you don't want people climbing the antenna, that type of stuff. Okay, so that's, in a nutshell, how you figure out uh, where to put a modus station. Next, you got to figure out, well, what equipment do you actually need? We're not at the point yet where you can like just go to a Best Buy and buy like a Modus kit. You, you kind of need to get specific stuff from a few different places. Uh, and the main things you need are these four things. You need to get one or more antennas, some sort of pole or mast to put them on, uh, that electronic base station, that little computer, and some sort of power supply. So let's start with the antennas. And I'm going to go back to this view shed picture again real quick, just to remind you that in our hypothetical example here, uh, it looks like we'd get good coverage uh, from like the northeast to the south. So uh, kind of like uh, one third of this circle might be a good candidate to de detect birds that are flying by with modus tags. So uh, how does that translate into the antennas we need? So as, as I mentioned earlier, these antennas, these weird looking antennas, they're technically called Yagi antennas, are are uh, directional. You point them in the direction you want them to listen to. So in this picture, maybe you'd put one up pointing to the northeast, maybe you'd put another one up pointing to the south. Uh, every now and then, uh, there is a motor station that uses uh, another type of antenna called an omnidirectional. That's what we used at Bear Divide. And they just, they listen in all directions. Uh, and you would think, well, hell, that sounds way better. The downside is they're not as sensitive. Uh, these omni, an omni antenna can only pick up birds maybe within a mile or so. That was no problem for bear to buy because they're literally flying right past this building. But for uh, for most places, you want one of these these uh, big directional antennas that you can you aim to the to the direction you want them to listen to. Uh, you'll notice often with modus stations that there's pairs of antennas pointing in the same direction. Like if you look at this one, you can see these two antennas with the red arrows are pointing in the same direction. And there's two other antennas with the green arrows pointing in another direction. And that's because uh, of this kind of annoying thing about the MODIS uh, universe. Uh, there are different companies that make the uh, transmitters that you put on birds. And not all companies use the same frequency for their for the bird transmitters to broadcast on. There's two different frequencies. And uh, when you set up a motor station, if at all possible, you want to be able to listen to 
to both of these two frequencies because you don't know which type of transmitter the bird flying past you is going to have. So you end up putting up uh, pairs of antennas. That, that that's that's what you're you're seeing here. Okay, so that's that's enough about antennas. Uh, now you need the pole to put them on, which is called an antenna mast, and that could be that could be something kind of elaborate like this that you know goes up a good I don't know thirty yards or so and is set into concrete, or it can just be like a simple pipe like I showed you earlier that's bolted to the side of a building or just stuck in the ground. And then you need to have this uh, this base station. There's really only one company that makes these, and virtually everyone that does a motor station buys this one this one product from this one company in Canada called Cellular Tracking Technologies. And when you buy it, you tell them how many antennas you're going to connect to it and how it's going to connect to the outside world uh, via cellular connection. You'll notice this one here actually has a little cell, cell phone chip. That's what that, that kind of brown uh, little flag looking thing inside is that's actually a cellular antenna in there but is it going to connect by cellular is it going to connect by uh wi-fi because you're you're near a wi-fi uh source that type of thing you, you tell them do, I, do you want a waterproof case or not you, you you customize it and they they make it exactly the way you want uh modus has gotten really popular so I, I do want to mention if you guys are thinking about actually pursuing this it can take you a good two or three months to get your box from these people. It's just it's just a few folks up in there, up in Ontario, putting the, kind of putting these things together by hand. Uh, and if you don't have a power source, you're going to need uh, solar energy to run it. A, a, a pretty small solar panel is enough. Uh, that that one there is just fine. That's maybe just I don't know two by three feet. And you need a couple of things. You need a battery that the solar panel charges. A little bit of electronics. So. That's everything you need. You know where you want to put it. You got all this stuff. Now it's time to actually install it. And if you're wondering, can you do it yourself? Often you can. Yeah. Uh, if you're setting up some real tall tower, you probably want to hire like actual like antenna people. But for just bolting a pole to the side of a building and running some wires into, into the building, uh, if you've got some, some uh, you know, like carpentry chops, some or if you or someone in, you know, in your group has some chops like that, if certainly if they're any, like a home contractor, they'd have no trouble doing this. I was a carpenter for a few years and I've, I find this stuff, you know, this is completely within my, in, within my skill set, and I'm not, I am not God's gift to carpentry. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it is doable and uh, you can put these things up. So after you've done all of that, your one final step is you go and you go back to the Modus website and you just, you register it. You tell them uh, that, hey, there's a new Modus listening station on the planet. Here's where it is. Here's what it's called. Here's where the antennas are pointing. And uh, and it's up, it's up and running and you have successfully uh, added added another spot to, to the Modus universe. So, uh, one final bit, you probably wonder what all this costs, and uh, I can I can run it all down. Uh, the, the station that I described there, uh, putting it at that nature center with, uh, say, four antennas pointing in two different directions, uh, electricity there, you could probably get everything you need for around 4,000 uh, bucks. If you're adding a solar panel and some more electronics for that, that's gonna that's gonna kick it up a thousand or two, fifteen hundred somewhere in there. Uh, if if it needs to be like enclosed, uh, you know, behind like barbed wire fence because you're worried about vandalism, or so, obviously that's gonna cost a bit more. But typically we're in the range of like four five thousand dollars to do an uh to get a, a motor station up and running. And uh, and once they're up and running, they're rugged. They run they run for years. And uh, so for, you know, for a group like Passing Audubon, for a group like you, it's actually, it's absolutely uh, a thing that you folks could accomplish. And as I, I've said, you know, Lord knows we need them. We need more stations. And uh, we'd love it if we could get some down, down with you folks. And if by some miracle you there or 
uh, your university or your, your your civic group or whatever, or just your, you know your group of uh, friends decide to want to put one up, I'm I and all of us at Pasadena Audubon are ready to help you. Feel free to ping me anytime. Uh, drop me an email right there. Just write to Modus at Pasadena Audubon, and uh, and uh, let's get some more let's get some more uh, Modus stations up and running. And with that, I think uh, that that's what I have for you folks. And I'm happy to uh, talk some more about it or take questions from you. Wow, that's great, Chris. Thank you for such great information about this. Um, one of the questions was, how far apart um, should should the MODA stations be? So like, say, for example, if we were to install one at our nature center in Oceanside, um, where would the next station, what would make sense for the next station, like 50 miles or I don't know what? Uh, it it can vary. As I said, a typical range for detection is like 10 or 15 miles. So as you get them closer to that, they're starting to overlap more and more. So that's maybe dropping their, uh, their efficiency a little bit. But we're nowhere near the saturation point you know, here, here in California, I would say if you're, if you're more than 10 miles away from the next motor station, go ahead and put it up where you're thinking. I, th I think that would just be fine. Okay. Uh, Jeannie, you had a question or comment? Yeah. I just wanted to tell you that um, the, uh, the Torrey Pines docents um, had a lecture. We have monthly lecturers and uh -huh. This last um, lecture was by Tammy, Dr. Tammy Russell at Scripps, who is doing a study on brown pelicans. And oh, yeah, she, yeah. And she's putting modus on them because yes. as, as common as they are, there's very little known about them, especially about individuals and their movements. And um, she's banned it. And she came, her, her lab, uh, together with a couple other labs, came up with this very clever um a pack that goes around the pelican's leg and it has a little tiny solar panel mm -hmm. on it and and a battery and um and one of the sensors and um uh she's banned to 20 some so far and this spring planning on another 30 so we're going to learn a whole lot more about brown pelicans than we knew before yeah yeah it's it's a fantastic project and and actually uh uh some of those tags were paid for by Pasadena Audubon. We're, we, well, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we 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 actually we actually fund that project. Yeah, it it is it, it's very interesting. And and yeah, the tags are amazing. They they uh, I forget what company it was they they custom designed those yeah. to come up with tags that can handle being on birds that dive in the water a lot. Yeah. Yeah, that was a big problem because you know because of their dives, you know they they the the, the impact is huge when when they're going after a fish so yeah yeah uh they yeah. couldn't put them on the back it wouldn't work <laughs> yeah. and it, it you know and it kind of highlights a really kind of interesting problem we have here in california in the west right now we have this kind of chicken or the egg problem in that we don't have a lot of motor stations yet it's gotten way better uh as i said we've got about a hundred now but because we don't have as many motor stations and researchers aren't aware that we have uh, more motor stations than we used to, there aren't as many researchers here on the West Coast that are doing MODIS projects yet. And uh, so one of the things we've been trying to do is to really get the word, word out in the scientific community that yes, hey, there are more stations, keep, you know, take a look at the map uh, and uh, and maybe MODIS, you know, will fit into your plans too. And as another part of that, we're trying to push to, uh, increase funding and increase the availabilities of, of, of the, uh, the tags to let more researchers know that, uh, that, you know, th this is perhaps a tool they could use in their research. I think the ornithological research community is well aware of MODIS in general, but I think some California and Pacific coast people may not be thinking about it as much as they could yet. And the other thing, of course, really is we would love, 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 to get more modus tags put on birds down in Central and South America, more birds that are coming up the Pacific Flyway. Uh, so there's there's like you know anywhere 
folks want to contribute, Audubon groups or whoever want to contribute, there's room for you. There's room to build more stations. There's room to to fund researchers with tags. There's room to uh, fund bird banders so they can go get the training to put tags on. There's uh, there's room to go play play with all the data on the Modus website. Uh, there there's uh, there's great opp opportunities for. We discovered this at Passing Audubon. There's great opportunities for uh, fundraising around Modus. We had a fundraiser to, to help pay for the station, and uh, and we'll be kicking off more fundraising uh, about providing tags where people will be able to basically adopt a bird. Like you can adopt a, uh, a whale in whale tracking programs, that, that type of thing. You'd be able to adopt a bird, you know, be 250 bucks. We'll buy a transmitter. We'll tell you what bird it's put on. And when, you know, if you get a report about your bird, we'll make sure to let you know, we'll send you a picture of your bird, all that type of thing. I mean, the <laughs> fundraising possibilities are, are, you know, are, are right there. Uh, I think really, really easy to do. And, and I think I have, I have great optimism, optimism for them. Um, our, our president, Kurt, has asked a question. Yeah. Can you do a viewscape from our center? Or I, I don't know if one's oh. been done already or. Uh, yeah, just uh, send me the address or the lat latitude or longitude. You can email it to me at, at modus at pasadenaaudubon.org. Uh, and yeah, I'll be, I'll be delighted to do it. And and heck, if you if you folks are starting to think about this seriously, I'm I'll hop in the car and come on down and take a look at the place. Uh, you know, I I no, you know, I have you know have have I have enthusiasm and will travel. Uh and uh yeah, yeah. A any anything I could do to help you or any other group in Southern California to get more of these things. We're 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 we can't wait to help. And another question. Can a large raptor damage an antenna by perching on it? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, I suppose possibly, yeah. Like I wouldn't want, you know, like a stellar sea eagle to sit on one of the antennas. Or, yeah. Uh, when we put up the antennas at Bear Divide, we actually had to get approval from the Fish and Wildlife Service because it's technically in uh, the zone where it's possible for a condor to appear, for a California condor to show up. And they had to have assurance that there was no possible way, not that the condor could hurt the antenna, but that the antenna could not possibly hurt the condor. Uh, so the antennas are, they're pretty sturdy. Uh, uh, if you remember, I know I keep going back to this reference of like the antennas that folks had like back in your parents or grandparents time on, on, on your TV antennas, they look like that. They tend to be built a bit more ruggedly. So, I would think it would be, it'd be pretty tough for a bird. It would, I mean, it would have to be like eagle or something, to really uh, damage damage one of the antennas. And uh, and one of the cool things about the motor station is, uh, typically the way they're set up is, they uh, they phone home every few hours, so you can go to the Modus website and see you know is my station up and running and you can you, know, you can you know confirm that it's still it's still talking to the modus repository successfully there, there's some more advanced things you can do to make sure the antennas are working i tend to go look at our, our station at bear divides in, a, in a, you know, a somewhat isolated place i mean there's a road there you can up to it but you know it's a it's a 40 minute drive or so i i go up there Oh, three or four times a year just to kind of, you know, rattle, rattle the mast around to make sure things aren't falling apart. But uh, the antennas have been, you know, rock, rock steady. And I, you know, it's not, it's not an exceptional rugged. It's just a typical install. They tend to be pretty, you know, pretty strong and pretty reliable. Well, the questions I see in the chat, does that, anyone else have a question? If so, you can unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Looks like we got it all pretty well covered. Okay. Great. Oh, well, uh, oh, someone did pop in. Barbara says, we are concerned about how big it is. Yeah, it's, it looks like, you know, it looks like a TV antenna. Uh, and we're less used to seeing those than, uh, than we were a generation or so ago. Uh, and if it's stuck up on a big pole high up, 
you do start to, you know, you have to make sure that the, a, a really strong wind isn't going to bend it. You wouldn't want it to be up on like, just like a, a you know, you don't, you don't use like a plastic piece of pipe that you buy at Home Depot and it could like flop, flop around. It needs to be a bit sturdier than that. And if it goes up a little bit higher, sometimes they'll put down, they'll put, you know, go guy lines down, which I agree can be more obtrusive. Uh, but, uh, you know, maybe not. I mean, it, it's really worth looking at each individual site to see, well, you know, do you really gain more by going up higher? Maybe it doesn't need to be very high at all and still, you know, and still reap the benefits. Uh, it's also, oh, I should say, it's, uh, if you happen to have access to a, a building with a flat roof, uh, you know, uh, some sort of high, high rise, uh, uh, apartment building, a uh, mm -hmm. uh, a multi-story building at a university, it's very simple to put one on a flat roof. You don't have to drill into the roof. There, there's uh, there's kind of like mast holders that you just set flat on the roof. You just put some cinder blocks on it to give it some weight so it doesn't tip down. And you can, you know, you can set the whole thing up and you can set the whole thing up in an hour. Uh, and that, that's a, that's a, a way that a, a lot of places have done. It may, it, and the great thing about that, as I said, it's easy to set up. And uh, if they ever need to take it down or want to remove it, it's you haven't done any damn, you haven't drilled any holes in the building, nothing like that. So it's, it's, it's another possibility. There's a there's a lot of there's a lot of ways you can do clever and somewhat you know unobtrusive stuff. The the one downside is you the the antennas do look the way they look, and it just the physics of it, they have to look that way. They uh they uh. They, they can't be as easily disguised as say like, you know, cellular phone towers that they can make look like, you know, like palm trees or, or pine trees. You can't, you can't do that with, with the modus stuff. It's just, the technology is just different, but you know, it's a small price to pay for birds. Any other questions, anybody? Okay. Looks like we've got everything. So um okay. thank you for coming. And um yeah, Barbara is actually, I think, the person that was looking into this. Um so um Barbara, okay. Barbara, if you can uh, still hear me there, if you want to follow up with Chris, I think you already were planning to do that and um let him know our address so he can uh, run his little uh map Yeah, just thing. just yeah. email me. Easiest one to remember is just modus at PasadenaAudubon.org. And, uh, you know, and all of you, feel free to pass that on to anyone else that might be interested in, in, in doing this stuff or hearing more about it. Great. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye, folks.